Hi everyone, thank you for joining my lecture on chapter 15 where we will be covering gram-negative cocci and spirochettes. In this lecture we will be discussing specifically morphological characteristics of spirochettes. We'll also discuss methods of disease transmission for Neisseria and treponema. Compare and contrast Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. And then we are going to finish up with a discussion regarding the prevalence, clinical stages, and long-term effects of syphilis. Neisseriaceae is a gram-negative aerobic bacteria, and it is classified as spherical-shaped or cocci, but some are short, slightly rod-shaped bacteria, and those are called cocobacilli. They have specific virulence factors that include their ability to produce endotoxins, as well as some various structural characteristics that allow them to adhere to different types of tissues. Now, there are approximately 10 uh, species within the genus of Neisseria, and two of those are pathogenic to humans, and those are the ones that uh, the one that causes meningitis and the one that causes gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea is a diplococcus bacteria that is microaerophilic and capnophilic. Remember, capnophilic means that they prefer a carbon dioxide rich environment and they are always considered a pathogenic organism. They are identified by culture, gram stain, and immunodiagnostic techniques. Uh, and many of the strains have become antibiotic resistant, which has made it uh, increasingly difficult to treat the disease caused by this bacteria, which is gonorrhea. Sometimes referred to in slang terms as the CLAP, it is a significant sexually transmitted disease that affects both men and women. The CDC reported in 2013 that over 300,000 uh, cases occurred nationally, and those that are uh, the highest risk of uh, getting the disease are between ages 15 and 24, and this bacteria is transmitted during any and all types of unprotected sexual contact at any age. The clinical presentation of gonorrhea um, occurs when bacteria attach to the mucus cells in the genitourinary tract, rectum, or oropharynx. Then the bacteria make their way through the epithelial cells into the epithelial space, and that's where they kind of set up shock. Now, secondary infections can occur if it gets into the circulatory system. Uh, after exposure, it could be many months before there is any signs of the disease. And this can unfortunately cause scarring and, and irreversible damage to the reproductive organs. And it may lead to the female becoming um, uh, infertile or, uh, or unable to conceive. And it could also result in the male becoming uh, infertile as well and unable to um, produce sperm. In the female uh, and in the male, uh, gonorrhea will present with pain or burning during urination, and there will also be increased discharge. In the female, the cervix is typically the place where the infection occurs, so there will be discharge from the cervix, and the male will be discharged from the penis. Females, we might also see vaginal bleeding in between 
um, menses. In females, this can also lead to pelvic inflammatory disease and present with a tender abdomen and uh, inflammation of the fallopian tubes. It can also increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy in the female. For the male, infection uh, typically occurs in the urethra and it has about a two to five day incubation period. And um, other uh, symptoms could include um, anal itching or soreness if the rectum were to become infected, discharge or bleeding from the rectum, and also painful bowel movements. Uh, gonococcal pharyngeal infection or pharyngitis can also be um, transmitted via oral sex. This can present with a mild sore throat and it can also disseminate throughout the blood and attack the joints. Um, types of behaviors or circumstances that elevate risk of the disease are having unprotected sex, either vaginal, anal, or oral sex, having multiple sexual partners, risky behavior due to consumption of drugs or alcohol, and failure to disclose infection status or previous encounters with infected individuals. To diagnose gonorrhea, they will order a urinalysis. They will also take swab samples of the urethral meatus, the cervical os, the rectum, or the throat, depending on where the um, symptoms present themselves. Up to this point, infection, uh, gonococcal infections remain the second most common reported sexually transmitted disease. Uh, they have come up with a quick test called the nucleic acid amplification test, NAAT, um, and they deem this as the most reliable screening test for gonococcal and chlamydial infections. However, um, it isn't uh, a culture per se because it's not um, maintained in a proper lab environment uh, to allow for culture and sensitivity, but it is highly accurate. As far as treatment, that's going to be antibiotic therapy. They used to prescribe penicillin, but over time, the Neisseria gonorrhoeae has become increasingly resistant to that, uh, as well as other antibiotics like the sulfonamides, tetracycline, fluoroquinolones, and ciprofloxin. Um, so they do suggest um, specific injectable um, antibiotic therapy. Uh, gonorrhea can be passed to the neonate as it moves through the vaginal canal during birth. And as a result, it is the standard of care to instill um, uh, ophthalmic ointment, antibiotic ointment, which is uh, erythromycin is what they use. And they put that in the eyes of every newborn baby. Neisseria meningitidis is an encapsulated gram-negative diplococcus bacteria and it is nearly identical to Neisseria gonorrhoeae. The only difference is, is that Neisseria meningitidis has a polysaccharide capsule that has antiphagocytic properties. And they're, um, they have found that Neisseria meningitidis uh, is only found in humans and it predominantly colonizes in the nasopharynx and there are several risk factors that are associated with Neisseria meningitidis which include, include age, community settings, uh, individuals with certain diseases, 
or taking certain medications or having certain procedures that may weaken their immune system. Four and foreign travel. Now, Neisseria meningitis causes meningococcal meningitis. Symptoms associated with meningitis include fever, headache, stiff neck, nausea or vomiting, photophobia, which is sensitivity to light, and changes in mental state, such as confusion or unresponsiveness. These neurological um, uh, signs are related to irritation and inflammation of the meninges increased intracranial pressure. Um, something else that can happen is rigidity of the spine. Rigidity of the cervical spine is referred to as Brudzinski sign. There could also be hamstring spasms, Koenig's sign, convulsions, and exaggerated reflexes. In newborns, we may not see these symptoms. It may present itself as um, the baby may be slow to respond, uh, relatively inactive, irritable, and it may not be eating well. Um, there also may be vomiting associated with it as well. Meningococcal septicemia or meningococcemia is a generalized bloodstream infection that is caused by Neisseria meningitidis. This causes damage to the blood vessels due to an endotoxin that is secreted by the bacteria. And uh, it, it um, can also lead to bleeding into the organs because of this and the skin and other tissues. In addition to that, um, can also cause thrombosis and disseminated intravascular coagulation, which causes widespread coagulation. And then because the body has used up all of those coagulation factors, then leads to massive hemorrhaging within the patient. Death can occur in a matter of hours. Um, in the less serious cases, um, the patient may require amputation of their fingers, toes, or extremities. Signs and symptoms of meningococcal septicemia include fatigue, vomiting, chills, cold hands or feet, severe body aches and pain, um, increased respiration and heart rate, red pinpoint rash, and dark purple skin rashes uh, in the later stages. There is an acute form of meningococcal septicemia called Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, and it has nearly a 100% death rate, comes on very quickly, and is characterized by fever, chills, weakness, nausea, vomiting, myalgia, and headache. And within just a few hours, the patient can become delirious. Uh, as the disease progresses, again, we have DIC, shock, destruction of adrenal glands, and pulmonary insufficiency. The majority of patients die within 24 hours of contracting the illness despite treatment. Mild, milder form can present with low-grade fever, arthritis, and small lesions for a few days or weeks. Uh, other less common affections associated with Neisseria meningitidis is pneumonia, urethritis, and arthritis. The way that they diagnose this is by growing the bacteria from a obtained culture. Uh, the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid are going to be the top two preferred um, fluids for culture, but they can also obtain cultures from synovial fluid and skin lesions as well. Antibiotic treatment for these individuals should be started as soon as possible. Um, and in the United Kingdom, they had this public awareness campaign and uh, they called it the Tumblr test. 
And so what they would ask is that parents would take a clear glass if they thought that their um, child might have this um, meningococcal septicemia and press it against the rashy area. And if the spots remained, then they were to seek treatment immediately. There is a rapid test for diagnosing meningococcal um, septicemia, and that is referred to as the polymerase chain reaction assay, or PCR. And uh, it is used specifically for CSF cultures. The treatment is typically antibiotics. Penicillin is at the top of the list, although cephalosporins have been um, uh, have been working as well. In addition to that, um, patients may have to come into the operating room and get surgical debridements, and as a result, subsequent skin grafting. There are vaccines that they have. Uh, developed for the prevention of meningococcal infections. And the two common ones are the meningococcal polysaccharide vaccine, or MPSV4, and the meningococcal conjugate vaccine, MCV4. And these are recommended for infants and young children only if they meet specific criteria. Morixella is of the genus Morixellosi, and it is a gram-negative non-motile uh, cocci. The members of the genus are strictly aerobic, and most of them are uh, kind of a, a shape between a cocci and a rod, so more coccobacilli. And the three most well-known species are Morixella non-liquefactions, Morixella lacunata, and Morixella cateralis. Now, Morixella cateralis is the third most common cause of otitis media in children. Uh, 30 to 100 percent of infants between birth and one year of age. Um, by adulthood, numbers decrease to 1 to 10 percent. Um, treatment of um, the uh, M. cateralis is typically with antibiotics such as penicillin, amoxicillin, or ampicillin. And um, there is currently no vaccine, but ongoing research to find a vaccine. Spirochetes are organisms in the order Spirochetalis, and the order has two families, Spirochetaceae and Leptospiraceae. Spirochetes are either facultative anaerobes or aerobes. The species that cause human diseases are in the genera Treponema, Borrelia, and Leptospira. Spirochetes are long, snake-like organisms, and they appear as tight coils under the microscope kind of like a corkscrew or an old telephone cord. They have these internal flagella that allow them to move more swiftly through fluid in a corkscrew-like fashion. The number and shape of flagella that they have varies among species. Um, some species have uh, axial filaments with the hook at the end, while others are thin and tightly coiled, and yet others are more loosely coiled and somewhat thicker. Uh, Spirocata, they're free-living, non-pathogenic inhabitants of the mud and the water, and uh, are responsible for a disease referred to as endemic syphilis. Leptospira typically affects animals, and Borrelia includes several species that are transmitted via vectors like lice 
and ticks and cause Lyme disease and relapsing fever. They are saprophytic uh, and uh, as such can be found in the soil and sewage and decaying matter, also in standing water. Some of them are in symbiosis um, with um, uh, the stomachs uh, within the stomachs of cows and other ruminants and uh, in the digestive tract and oral cavities um, of other animals and humans. Uh, Spirochets were first discovered by Otto Obermeier, who is a German physician, and he discovered Spirochets in 1868. There are four subspecies of Treponema pallidum, and the diseases they cause are uh, Treponema pallidum pallidum, which causes syphilis, Treponema pallidum pertenu, which causes yaws, Treponema pallidum endemicium, which causes endemic syphilis, and Treponema pallidum carotium, which causes non venereal syphilis. Now, Treponema pallidum. Uh, is the most virulent and it is the causative agent of sexually transmitted uh, venereal disease called syphilis. Syphilis is a slow evolving disease with short symptomatic periods um, and then prolonged asymptomatic periods. Uh, in the incubation period for the disease, uh, that is seen from 10 to 90 days, and it precedes the clinical presentation of signs and symptoms. Because syphilis, um, or because spirochetes that cause syphilis requires moist, dark environments in which to thrive, it's ideally suited for transmission through sexual contact. However, it can also be transmitted through infected hypodermic needles, blood transfusion, breast milk, and saliva. It can also be transmitted across the um, placental barrier as well. Um, way back when, um, without knowing the origin of the disease, different countries would blame the disease of syphilis on its neighbors, referring to it as Italian pox, um, by the French, and the English called it French pox. Uh, famous figures that were suspected of having syphilis uh, historically were George Washington, Adolf Hitler, and Napoleon Bonaparte. In um, prior to the 1900s, um, they were treating syphilis with arsenic, and uh, which was very toxic and harmful to the individual. Today, we typically treat with penicillin and tetracycline. And there are four stages we're gonna talk about, the primary stage, the secondary stage, latent stage, and late tertiary stage. The primary stage is characterized by the multiplication of the bacteria at the site of entry. And this is uh, typically 10 to 60 days after exposure. Then we have these small um, ulcerous lesions that occur at the site, and these are referred to as cankers. The latent stage occurs between the primary and secondary stages. And this is when the spirochetes continue to invade the host tissue, but uh, the individual still remains asymptomatic. During the secondary stage, bacteria is spreading to other tissues of the body and can involve any organ of the body, although it does have an affinity for the central nervous system. Now the late or tertiary stage occurs 10 to 30 years after the initial infection. And this is where the spirochetes can inflict serious damage to uh, invaded tissues. And they kind of culminate in these specific areas of the tissues and form syphilomas or gumas. 
spirit jets may also um, invade other organs like the heart um, and depending on what organ it invades that is the way it is labeled so those that would impact the, the heart and the vasculature would be cardiovascular syphilis um, they can also invade the skeletal system and destroy bone and tissue and cartilage and lead to frequent fractures as well. In 1906, the Wasserman test was developed for the diagnosis of syphilis, and this test detects the presence of treponema pallidum pallidum through its reaction to substances in blood. Now, uh, treponema pallidum has never successfully been grown in a lab. Um, that is because it has to have a live host. So typically, that they have to take the organism directly from the infectious exudate of the host and quickly transmit it to an animal like a rabbit, guinea pig, or hamster. Today, there is um, the Venereal Disease Research Laboratory, VDRL, test and the rapid plasma regain test, the RPR. Um, they're not 100% completely reliable because they're sensitive to the amount of antibody present in the blood um, and the number of antibodies is not significantly high in the primary stage. So the gold standard for diagnosis is going to be a culture that is performed in vivo, typically within uh, rabbits. Now, uh, three other types of treponema that are non-venereal are pallidum pertenu, pallidum endemicium, and pallidum caratea. Now, pallidum pertenu is also referred to as yaws, and it um, typically occurs in tropical regions and begins as a little lesion on the skin. And uh, this initial one is called the mother yaw, and a yaw is typically uh, is a word used to refer to like an opening. Um, so this is how bacteria can enter the body, um, and then they're itchy, and um, once they are scratched, then that helps to spread the infection, and those lesion, lesions can progress to destroying the skin, bones, and other tissue. Pallidum endemicium is uh, the cause of endemic non-venereal syphilis that's also called B. gel, and it typically occurs in children that are younger than age 15 from regions of Africa, Asia, and India. Um, they think that it can be transmitted through contaminated water or direct contact with the lesions, but proper hygiene habits definitely help to spread the disease. Um, unlike the other um, non-venereal um, treponema pallidum, uh, Bigel is found in dry and arid climates, uh, such as Saudi Arabia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And then lastly, the pallidum keratium is also referred to as pinta, and pinta in Spanish means spot or dot, and uh, it is characteristic of pallidum keratium because it develops this depigmentation on the skin that is a ulcerative lesion. And uh, you can get it through direct contact. And in Nicaragua and Guatemala, uh, it's referred to uh, individuals infected with pallidum keratinum are referred to as los morados, which means the purple ones. Borella are helical in shape and have from three to 10 loose coils and 15 to 20 axial filaments. They are thicker and less curved than the treponemes. Species uh, include B. recurrentis, B. hermsii, 
and B. burgdorferi. Now, Borrelia are transmitted uh, via lice and ticks. B. hermsii is the cause of endemic, what they call relapsing fever, where burgdorferi causes Lyme disease. And collectively, they're referred to as the Borrelioses. Um, our friend Robert Cope was the one who proved that the fever was um, from um, Borrelia was actually the result of a, um, a tick in Africa called O. Mubata. And uh, he demonstrated that sparrow sheds could be transmitted via eggs to the progeny of infected female ticks. Borrelia burgdorferi was first isolated from the deer tick by Willie Bergdorfer in 1982. Um, and at that time it was thought to be the only strain, but since then we've identified 100 strains uh, in the United States alone. Uh, B. burgdorferi is really a unique bacteria. It's large, it's highly motile, it can swim effortlessly through our body fluids and our tissues, and its DNA is unique as well. It also has this gel-like coating of glycoproteins um, called a slime layer, and this serves as like the bacteria's suit of armor that helps to protect it from the host's immune response. It can also remain in the human body for years in a dormant state, and antibiotics will not affect it in that dormant state. Uh, B. burgdorferi causes Lyme disease, which is the most common tick-borne disease in the United States, and transmission typically occurs through the deer tick, uh, which is usually found in brushy areas or tall grass. Lyme disease affects many systems of the body at once. Individuals might test negative um, and be misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, or multiple sclerosis, and then they might test positive and have no symptoms at all. Symptoms of the disease do include skin lesions, uh, muscle pain, headache, stiff neck, fatigue, and swelling of the lymph nodes. Diagnosis uh, can um, occur by growing out the spiro sheds in a lab in a petri dish, unlike um, the treponema that can't be grown in a petri dish. Um, the Burkdorferi can. Uh, there are also several serologic tests that can be used, but the, the ELISA and the Western blot are the most commonly used ones. The way that they treat Lyme disease is with antibiotics like doxycycline, amoxicillin, um, and uh, then between 10 and 20% of individuals who complete antibiotic therapy might regress and um, have reoccurring symptoms. And if this is the case, that is chronic Lyme disease. Now the Borrelia recurrentis and Hermsii, they're uh, known to cause um, relapsing fever. And this is typically transmitted to humans by lice. Um, when we have situations where there are poor sanitary conditions, this increases the chance of transmission. And uh, when it does present itself, it does present with a fever that can reach up to 104 degrees Celsius. And then after its seven day incubation period, the individual could present with respiratory sim symptoms, central nervous system involvement, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, uh, and the patient may also be jaundiced as well. And typically penicillin is used to treat uh, relapsing fever, but tetracyclines 
um, can also be used as well. But the key here is to eliminating infestations of ticks and lice. Leptospirosis is caused by the Spirochet Leptospira interrogans. This disease is transmitted predominantly through water contaminated with animal urine. Uh, animals like dogs, domestic livestock, and rodents. The organism typically is lodged in the renal tubules of the host animals and gets flushed out upon urination. Drinking urine contaminated water from streams uh, is a common method of transmission, but they can also enter the body through breaks in the skin. There are three subspecies that uh, are a causal of leptospirosis, and that is uh, L. interrogans uh, canicola, L. interrogans pomona, and L. interrogans icterohemorrhagia. So uh, in the initial stage, that's referred to as the septicemic stage, and then it is followed by an immune stage. In the septicemic stage, we will see high fever and severe headache, may also see eye pain and photophobia, and uh, individuals may also have a hemorrhagic rash. Wiles disease is caused by Leptospira interrogans ictero hemorrhagiae, and it uh, uh, is also known as infectious hemorrhagic jaundice, and it is named after a German physician, Dr. A. Weil, and in 1886, he documented this black vomit, which was due to this severe jaundice of the individual. And he also documented that symptoms were similar to those of hepatitis. He also noticed that individuals that came down with this disease spent a good deal of time barefoot in um, wet and poorly drained areas that were contaminated with animal urine of rodents. Wiles disease can be fatal if left untreated, which is primarily due to liver or kidney damage. Diagnosis. To diagnose Wiles disease, we typically use microscopic examination of blood or CSF or urine. Uh, urine is most frequently used because the leptospires are harbored there for longer periods of time. Uh, blood cultures uh, are reliable, but serologic analyses such as microagglutination or macroscopic agglutination are used in most laboratories for defin definite diagnosis. Uh, antibiotics used to treat leptospira include doxycycline or penicillin. And of course, are more easier to treat if caught in the early stages of the disease. Uh, increased sanitation can help to reduce the incidence of diseases, and then individuals should avoid areas where uh, water could be contaminated with animal urine. There are some vaccines available for animals, but only offer partial immunity, and there is no current vaccine for humans. This concludes our discussion of gram-negative cocci and spirochets. I hope you found it helpful and mildly entertaining.